Well, uh, first, while we, while we get started, thank you very much for inviting me to come and talk uh, today. I'm going to be talking a little bit about the validation of our global list flood model. This is a different list flood to the one that was being talked about in the last presentation. This is the uh, list flood FP, which simulates floodplain hydraulics. So it's a true hydrodynamic model. Um, so over the last 18 months, we've been building a global application of the list flood FP uh, flood inundation model for both fluvial and pluvial flooding. We're simulating floods at one kilometer resolution globally, and then we're downscaling to 90 meter resolution. And we're simulating 10 different return period events for the, for the whole planet. And you can think of this as one of a number of recently developed global flood models. You know, we've, we've got GCMs, and, and now we're increasingly getting GFMs as well. Things like Kama Flood and Glowfris, other people in the audience are developing these. And really, all these groups, we've all been focusing to date on model development, but, but really, um, certainly for uh, this particular model, some rigorous validation is really required, and that's what I want to talk about today. So I'll just give a, a brief overview of the method. Um, so this is the standard list flood hydraulic model. It uh, uh, operates over a raster grid. This is a version of the, the shallow water equations minus convective acceleration written into a really efficient form. And like most hydraulic models, it, it needs some geometry and topography, and it needs some boundary condition forcing. And it, it takes those in and gets a, uses those to produce a bunch of outputs. So where do we get the geometry? Well, that's a custom processed SRTM uh, terrain data set and then some uh, remote sensing river widths. Uh, and I'll, I'll come on to how we do uh, the channel geometry in a moment. Then the flows and rainfall, that comes from a regional analysis of global gauge data and precipitation. We just had a paper on this accepted in water resources research, so you'll be able to have a look at how we do that uh, uh, at some later point. But essentially, we take the GRDC data and we uh, essentially do a regionalized flood frequency analysis so we can get the ret Q, uh, T return period flows for any point on the global river network with this. Um, and then typical hydraulic model, you take some flood observations and you calibrate and validate. Um, at the start of the talk, then, I mentioned downscaling, so just an aside about why that's needed. Um, clearly, uh, when you halve the grid resolution in a hydraulic model, you, you put the computational cost up by an order of magnitude. So there's a really strong incentive to simulate uh, at the scale, uh, only at the scale in which you really need to, and then downscale to recapture the detail. And what you see here is the, uh, some uh, downscaling results over the Niger inland delta. So you see a Landsat image from November 2007, and then a three kilometer list flood simulation. So that's a pretty coarse grid. But when you use, um, employ a downscaling algorithm, this one's Guy Schumann's downscaler, you recover a lot of the detail of the Landsat image just with an, uh, an offline downscaling step, which is a lot cheaper than the hydraulic model. So that's what we do. Um, so method details, it's, uh, the 2D flooding is a local inertial version of the shallow water equations. The, the pluvial flooding is simple overland flow routing that Chris Sampson, my PhD student, put together. Um, clearly at 1K, a lot of our channels are going to be smaller than the model grid, so we treat those as subgrid features using Jeff Neal's algorithm. We do our simulations on 10 degree by 10 degree, degree tiles on a high throughput computer, uh, computing setup. In fact, we use our undergraduate computing lab when it's not being used for teaching to run these simulations. So, you know, it's, it's not supercomputing, it essentially comes free with a university. You've all got one of these things. Um, we take the river widths from a remote sensing or a hybrid geomorphological technique. We set the river depths based on our return period, uh, bankful return period flow from, the, uh, from the, uh, the flood frequency analysis and the Manning equation, and, and we do that to ensure the, the onset of uh, floodplain flow occurs at the right time. We assume for the moment that the flood defences have failed, and put that all together, we, we've got a MATLAB framework of around about 30,000 lines of code which automates that system. So it's really just push button. We define as 10 degree by 10 degree tiles, hit the button, the model builds automatically and produces the results. So that's all, all very nice and it, it produces some really uh, neat images. This is Bangkok at, at 90 meter resolution. Some, quite a lot of people in the audience have seen these already. Um, Phnom Penh in Cambodia, uh, again really nice pluvial and fluvial simulations. St. Louis, USA, and we're looking at one in a hundred year uh, maps here in all of these. Vientiane in Laos, uh, Jakarta in Indonesia. So, 
those are all really nice, but the question then comes to scientists, like, are they any good? You know, it, it's very nice to produce a pretty picture, but uh, what are we looking at here? What's the model skill? And the validation research design, this is our first attempt, is to compare these simulations of the one in a hundred year floodplain to one in a hundred year hazard maps built using high quality local data. So these are FEMA type maps. Um, and we've got them for Alberta in Canada from the Alberta state government and for the, from the Thames and Seven Basins in the UK. So the Alberta maps are HECRAS models. They're built with ground surveyed cross sections and flows that are generated by uh, local analysis of flood frequency analysis of local data. Thames and Seven, same thing but these are 1D, 2D hybrid models and they're built with either LIDAR or IFSAR. So they're not perfect, nobody's saying these are truth, but they're certainly uh, likely to be an awful lot better than our global model, so they're, they're a good start for model validation. And we're going to benchmark those against the one in a hundred year flood extents from our global model built using SRTM, SRTM terrain. So it's got one metre vertical noise at, at one kilometre. So here's, um, here's the, the Calgary map. The areas in red are where the Alberta state government has produced HECRAS models. So the first thing you see is that the global model produces predictions everywhere for, for even really quite small river catchments down to, down to a few tens of kilometres squared. Um, and we also do pluvial flooding uh, as well as fluvial as well. But we can do the comparison just where, the, uh, where we have uh, benchmark models from the Alberta state government. So if you have a look at that, well, performance measures before I go on. So number of performance measures, typical ways of comparing imagery. Uh, we've got the hit rate, percentage correct wet uh, cells predicted correctly, false alarm rate, critical success index, which in previous papers we've called our F uh, statistic, which goes from 0 to 1, bias, 0 to 1 is under prediction, 1 to infinity is over, and then the aggregate error. And this is, this is going to turn out to be an interesting part of the story. So this is the mean absolute error in flooded fraction if we aggregate the model and observed data up to one kilometre and excluding the, the dry cells. So does the model performance scale up from the, the 90 metre level to, to, to one kilometre and how does the performance change? So these are, these are the kind of results that we get. This is Calgary. It's an urban area. It should be quite difficult for a model built with SRTM terrain to, to simulate correctly inundation in urban areas because the, the 90 metre grid of the, the, the SRTM is a lot bigger than the footprint of things like buildings. But we're not doing a, a too bad a job. The hit rate here is 75%. Green is where the mo global and state models agree. Blue and red are the over and under prediction. Uh, uh, but nobody's saying that the state model is perfect. Um, you know, it'll be better, but it, it's still not truth. Uh, uh, the true one in a hundred year flood. So I think that that's a reasonably skillful prediction for something that's built using uh, a global uh, flood frequency analysis and uh, SRTM terrain. Similar story uh, for Edmonton. Actually, this one's a bit better. It's more confined valley. Hit rate here is 81%. Um, and then the Thames and Seven basins. So the, the Thames and Seven, we've got data over the entire catchment, not for selected reaches. So it's a much more comprehensive test. You know, there's so much data here, it doesn't really plot up that well on, on these maps. But we're doing a pretty good job. Again, green, green is where we're, we're uh, predicting the same. And the areas of red over towards the left of the uh, uh, image, that's because that's the tidal floodplain of the Thames out near London. We don't have a tidal uh, storm surge forcing in the model, but it's there in the, in the government risk maps in the UK. So we wouldn't expect the model to perform particularly well there. And that, that bit of uh, um, uh, misprediction is, is, is pretty easy for us to explain. Elsewhere, we're not doing a bad job. Seven uh, Basin. This one's even easier. It's, it's a bit steeper. It's not groundwater dominated uh, like uh, the Thames. Hit rate here is 73%. And if we look at the bigger basins, the hit rate goes up, um, up some more as well. So looking at the results, clearly the hit rate is, is one that you'd like to look at. Hit rates look like they're sort of 65 to, to 83%. Um, that's not too bad. False alarm rates are, are pleasingly low. Uh, critical success index, our old F measure, ranges from 43, uh, 0.43 to uh, 0.67. Bias is, is, uh, is reason these are reasonably unbiased predictions. And as a consequence, when you look at aggregate error, when you look at, uh, at the error in flooded fraction at one kilometre, 
the, the mean uh, aggregate error drops to five or so percent, which is, which is pretty uh, pleasing. Um, so this tells us an important thing. I mean, all flooding is local. Um, and clearly, you, we want flood models to be correct locally. And, and it's only if you get them correct locally that they'll scale up to give you the right flood diffraction um, uh, statistics. So that looks pretty good. So to conclude, we've developed a 90-meter resolution global model, global hydrodynamic model for pluvial and fluvial <coughs> flooding using only publicly available and global data sets. So stuff that, that we, that's free to air that um, anybody can get that, uh, that, it, that has global coverage. When we compare those models to national hazard maps, even though that, uh, we're, we've got this global flood frequency analysis to, uh, to determine the Q100 flows, um, and we're using SRTM terrain, even with that, we, we fit to the local the, uh, hazard maps. We've got critical success index values of between 0.43 and 0.67, and better in catchments that are, that are greater than 500 kilometers squared. For context, if I build a, a list flood model and with LIDAR data with 10 centimetre vertical error and I drive it with gauged flows and I compare that for flood events where we've got really good SAR images of the flood extent, I still only get CSI values of 0.7 or 0.8 typically. Um, so for a global model, CSI values of 0.4 to, to 0.7 aren't doing too badly. Our best global models approach the performance of really bespoke local, artisanal local models. So the mean absolute error falls to, uh, in flood diffraction falls to about 5% of 1K resolution. So uh, if you're interested in uh, just uh, flood diffraction at 1K scales, then actually this model's doing a pretty skillful job and it's probably quite usable. Um, uh, and overall, I would say that the, the, it's pleasing skill for a, a fraction of the cost of building a, a, a bespoke local model. So if you don't have uh, local data available, this might be a good option. If you are, for example, Afghanistan or a developing country, this might be a good place to, uh, to go for that kind of information. Uh, and the future, well, we're, we've got a project with Google and the Natural Environment Research Council uh, in the UK to make global hazard layers open access on Google Earth. And uh, Geek Schumann and I will be, uh, we'll be talking about that uh, tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock at the uh, Google stand in the exhibition area. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Uh, no, we haven't. That's probably a good idea, isn't it? Yeah. So we're, yeah, we're, we're, we're our hit rate is probably uh, a bit favourable in that. Um, we could do that. The river is, is, is not so wide compared to the, the width of the floodplain, so I'm not sure it'll make more than a, a few percent difference, but good point. So there's a number of areas where this model's not yet going to perform particularly well. I mean, it doesn't have reservoirs in it for a start. So if there's reservoirs op operations that are, that are going to impact on, on big floods, then they won't be in there. Rice paddies, around places like uh, Bangkok, there's a number of those. Uh, and you, you see some of the rice paddy structure. I wouldn't claim that we, we pick those up particularly well. Um, so... I think there's, there's a number of additional validation steps that are needed here. We need to uh, simulate some actual events where we've got really good SAR data. Um, we've got to look at some more complex hydrodynamic settings, maybe braid channels and really big rivers and really engineered rivers. Um, so the stuff I've presented today is really the first step on what's got to be a wider process. But so far, you know, picking some, some relatively straightforward test case, but still rigorous data, we're doing better than I would have expected. I, I was surprised when I looked at this. I thought, wow, this a, you know, I, I expected no skill at all. But actually, it's not so bad. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.